We want to begin by thanking you uh, for your support of our ministry over these past six, seven years. Uh, greatly appreciated, not only financially, but also uh, through your prayers. And I mentioned that if you wanted to be on our prayer list, uh, you could email me. I think, do we also have a clipboard over there? I'm not looking at you, I'm actually looking at mine. Do we have a clipboard to sign up? Okay, we'll have a paper to sign up on over there if you'd like to. And uh, we would love to have your email address. We send out a prayer email every uh, every Wednesday. And then in the uh, in the bulletin are some sermon notes um, that uh, you'll see. It looks uh, like this on the back of it. Uh, has about our ministry. It goes into a little bit more detail. On the inside is an article. If you get to work with my preaching, you can read that. And if you fill in the entire uh, sermon notes and give them to Harold Schuto, uh, he will give you a brand new car. So you've got all the new cars on it, and you're ready to go with that. And uh, so that'll be a big help. Way to go, Harold. Appreciate your uh, I left the back of my house uh, to make my way to the office. It was Sunday afternoon, and this was at our Cape May Courthouse Church on October 21, 1979. This was my first church. I was 24 years old. Very green, uh, very young. Um, had been the pastor of the church for about a half a year on this particular occasion. At the time, the church consisted of 10 acres, about... Um, uh, fronting, about one acre fronting Route 9 uh, down in Cape May Courthouse, which at this point runs parallel to the Garden State Parkway. In fact, there's a wooden fence that divides the two, and that's where the, that's where the church is. The house sits behind the church. In fact, between the back of the church and about 150 yards to where the parsonage is, is what we would call an area called wetlands. Uh, there's trees there. There's bushes there. There's thorns and and scrub brushes there, and and in the in the middle of this thing uh, is a pool of water. Not sure where the water comes from. It's not run off from the uh, the parking lot. There's no creek leading into it. It's not drainage. Uh, it must be fed by some sort of spring, I assume. And I'm convinced that every mosquito in South Jersey comes from this particular pool. Uh, that pool right there. Well, on this Sunday afternoon, I stopped by the water just to look and refresh myself. Water seems to do that to me. Maybe it does to you as well. When I had a, uh, a television program when I was pastoring, I would deliver it to a, great, a TV station, and um, I would, on my way back, go the long way so that I could go along the Susquehanna River, which down in the York County, Lancaster County area is really a wide and beautiful area. And I'd just park my car, and I'd pray, or I'd take a nap, or, you know, was just looking at the water it was very helpful. In fact, when I was writing my book on evangelism, I did so up at Word of Life, uh, which is a camp in upstate New York. And I wanted to do it there because they had this beautiful lake, Scrooge Lake, and, and they had these chalets. And I wanted to be in one focusing on that water so that that would help in the writing process. And indeed it did. The problem was it was off-season, and so they gave me this one chalet that was directed this way to houses in Scrooge Lake. And I thought, I can't do this. So I took the mirror off the wall, and I put it onto a chair so that I could look in the mirror and I could see the lake. And the book was then completed. So we were able to do it. The water does that. But something unusual happened to me when I stopped by that pool on this particular Sunday afternoon. I felt a tremendous peace from God. I've never felt that peace before. I've never felt that peace again. And it wasn't like a supernatural experience in the sense that I started speaking in tongues or prophesied or was slain in the spirit. No, no, none of that, none of that. There was just an overwhelming sense, and in this sense it was supernatural, of the presence of God, which was all my life. Fast forward three days to Wednesday, October 24th early afternoon. I'm in my office and I receive a phone call from my dad's pastoral assistant. Tom Smith and I had a good relationship. We always joked with each other and so we would talk to each other and we'd continue to joke from the time before. And I started joking like I normally do and there was silence on the other end of the phone. And then I heard somebody weep and I thought, oh 
don't know. Tom Smith, a retired state trooper, cut right to the chase. Your father has been killed in an automobile accident. Whoa. Ton of bricks. I needed to tell Bonnie and my younger sister, who was staying with us at that time, but both were teaching in our Christian school, and so it must wait till after school. And I remember getting up from my desk and walking out the front door to where the mailboxes were, which were across the street. And on my way back, God gave me a verse. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46.10, the first part of the verse. Be still. Perhaps that little visit at the pool was him preparing me for the worst news that I had ever had in my life. I think that's exactly what it was. And as that pool was still, I needed to be still too. I have a sermon on that first part of that verse, be still. Um, and in fact, I preached it here in 2011. I'll be testing you on that uh, towards the end of the no, I won't do that. But what I'd like to do today is I'd like to look at the second part of that verse within the first part. Be still, that was the first sermon I had. And know, I want to look at that phrase, and know that I am God. And I want to make a principle, I want to state a principle first before we support, before we start, which supports, um, which is supported by the words in this chapter. And I'm going to make some application also from the chapter, and I'm going to conclude by um, reading the chapter to you, or uh, by way of memory. All right, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to do that in a dramatic presentation. We'll see how that goes. But here's the principle. It's a very simple one. The more you know of God, the more content you will be in whatever circumstances come your way. Now you might be saying, well, that's a no-brainer. Maybe so. But this point hit me when I was reading and when I was studying for this sermon, and I was reading a surgeon by Charles Spurgeon, dated February 27, 1987. Uh, sometimes I go way back in reading what I'm doing. Spurgeon noted that the 18th century poet Alexander Pope said, quote, the proper study of mankind is man. He disagreed with that. Spurgeon said, when men of God make God their study, then they discover in him those things which make him a refuge for their hours of danger, a strength for their days of labor, and a help for the emergencies of every kind. And so that took me to that principle. The more you know God, or of God, the more content you will be when trouble comes your way. I wanted to run this principle by Bonnie, um, uh, a little while ago, not that long ago, this is a pretty fresh sermon here, and uh, we were sitting at dinner at an eatery, and I, I made a statement which I should have put into a question form. I didn't know I was going to do this for the sermon, but here was what the question should have been. Who do you trust more, me or the server? Now, the server was a nice person, and if the server was knew something about food or food service, I would say she might want to trust that person more. I know nothing about food service. I know how to eat. I don't know anything about food service. And she reminds me of that a lot, especially when we were at Pinewood. You don't know anything about food service, Dan. You're right, I don't. But overall, who do you trust more? Well, we've been married going on 42 years. We were dating for three years before that. She knows me pretty well. We're talking maybe 45 years of knowing each other. Naturally, one would think she would trust me more because she's gotten to know me more. That comes back to this principle here. The more you know of God, the more you will, you will trust in Him when trouble comes your way. Move this to a spiritual level. Would, he, would a non-believer have any trust in God at all? Any trust in God at all? No, no. They don't know God at all. How about a seeker? How about somebody who is starting to look um, like maybe they need to investigate this? Well, they might know a little bit more because you've shared with them a little bit. What about a newborn believer and their trust with God? Yes, they would trust him for their salvation, they did. But they haven't had that journey that a seasoned Christian has, and so their trust in God may not be that solid yet. They need some experiences where God comes through. How about a seasoned Christian? Do they trust in God? Yes, 
The more seasoned they are, the more they do. So the no-brainer principle stands. The more you know God, or of God, the more content you will be in whatever circumstances come your way. And in this chapter, we get to know God. Fact of the matter is, Psalm 46, God's name occurs seven times, Jehovah three times, and Elohim one time. The psalm tells us about God, and I came up with ten things about God in this chapter. So, what to know about God? Well, first of all, God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. There's three right off the bat. We start with our refuge. The word refuge means a shelter, hope, trust. It speaks of a place of safety. It's a, a place of true protection. When I see the word refuge in the Bible, I think of the cities of refuge. There were six of them. Six of them. When Moses was telling them about the land, there was going to be six cities or towns uh, in which a person who accidentally killed somebody could run to for safety. For example, maybe they have a, an axe and the head flies off and it hits somebody and kills them. Or an ox cart jerks forward, knocking someone over, and it runs over them and they die. Or, or, or somebody sitting in your lazy boy recliner and, and it breaks and causes a person to hit their head on the floor or, and, or the tile and they die. What are you going to do? Well, according to what was set up by Jewish law, you would run to a city of refuge and that city would give you asylum until a case could be heard, until a trial could take place. If found not guilty, the person would need to remain in the city until the death of the high priest, at which point they could then go home and resume their life there. Otherwise, the avenger of death, the family member charged with avenging the victim's death, could kill him, according to Numbers 35 19. So a city of refuge. Uh, that's a pretty important place to be if you needed it. I've never been much into types when it comes to the Old Testament because it's, it's not an exact science or easily understood. A type is something that happened in the Old Testament or is mentioned in the Old Testament as an example, and then it is still fulfilled in the New Testament. For instance, when the children of Israel were sinning again as they were crossing the desert and uh, God brought snakes to them, to bite them, and they would die, and then God said to Moses, put a snake on a pole, and if they look to that snake, um, I will heal them. And um, John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, that's a type, you know, type in the Old Testament, there it is fulfilled in the New Testament. So might this be. If we, a follower of Jesus, Christ is our refuge. We as sinners find a refuge in him. We're, we're guilty, but he takes that guilt from us. Even in times of trouble, we can take refuge in him. So much better to take refuge in him than to take refuge in humankind. It is better to take refuge in God than to trust in man. Psalm 118.8. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Psalm 8, or Proverbs 18.10. So God is our refuge, and you can see the second one already. God is our strength. I used to tell folks that I had the strength of ten men. Now I, I, I kind of did. Um, I, I have a, a one story that I can tell you where, according to New York, there's probably a picture of me, or my name is somewhere there. I used to work for a company that would uh, move big machines, big machines. In fact, this one press that we were going to move weighed the equivalency of a 747 jet. It was solid steel. And we had to lift that thing up out of the pit and then lay it over and take it out and then get it onto the truck. This was an amazing thing. And I was just between churches, I believe, and I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. But I, they would tell me what to do and I would do it. And at one point they said to me, um, the, the, the owner, Don Frick, said, Dan, lift that I beam up so we can put a, a chain underneath it. And, and so that's what I did. I went over there and I lift the I beam right up. And, and the guy standing beside him said, did he lift that I beam? And it was a big I beam. This wasn't a little thing. This was a big thing. And, and Don Frick said, yes, he did. And I became uh, immortalized. Uh, and this, uh, of the what, what the guy didn't realize is that the I-beam was balanced on, on a piece of, of, of wood that was, that was across there. So it was like lifting a baby carriage up. I mean, there was no weight to it because it was on this balance. You, you know what that's like. So, strength of 10 men. Well, now I kind of say, yes. I have the strength of ten men, but think really tiny men. Think plastic uh, army men uh, about that big. Well, here the word refers to power, might, boldness to be mighty. The Bible has many examples of God's strength, physical examples, Gideon and Samson, to name a two from the book of Judges, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and the brick iron oven fire, as well as Daniel, and the lions of the uh, uh, and the lion's den mentioned two others from the book of Daniel. Those are those are strength type of things. In all cases, whether it is physical strength or spiritual strength, God is more powerful than anything this world can produce. And this thought is brought to me every time I take off on an airplane. Why is that? Big? Well, the thrust of that airplane to get me off the ground as well as everybody else in all the luggage is amazing. But compared to God, it's like a bathtub toy. All right? His strength is so much greater. And I think of this every time. And I smile, and Bonnie looks at me, and she sees me smiling, because that's what I'm thinking of. His strength is incredible. From the prophet Isaiah 41, 29, he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might. He increases their strength. And this was read yesterday beautifully, read yesterday at the service, a beautiful service. Verse 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is our strength. And then he's our help. The book of Psalms has verses on God being our help. One of my favorite ones comes from the one we read this morning. Only I'm going to read it from the King James Version. It says, I will lift up mine eyes from whence comes my help. You say, why do that? Well, from 1910... Until 1968, the Bible Fellowship Church had a place called Mizwood Grove, a summer camp for the entire family. Think Civil War era pets. The story is told that an offering was taken for the pastors during each of the two weeks of camp meeting. Sometimes, not enough money would come in. And so, there was a businessman who lived in a mass who owned a, um, a store and they would talk to him, and he would then give them some money to help this out. His last name was Wentz. And so the pastors would quote this verse, From Wentz comes our help. <laughs> that actually got to be a picture of my dad, uh, who was there at the time, obviously. And, and that's my favorite picture of my dad. He was a pastor as well at Bible Fellowship Church. So, um, and, and I've used that verse, too. The Philadelphia Eagles got a new quarterback a couple years ago, right? And his last name is what? Wentz. And so I quoted, that's not a picture of Wentz. Um, I, and so I quoted that verse as well, and I did so on Facebook. And I had uh, one uh, lady took umbrage uh, on this, misusing the Bible. She wrote, well, what will you say when God asks you why you distorted this verse? I did not have an answer for her. Um, Subsequently, I need friends on Facebook, all right? So she, no, she still is. So at any rate, Psalm 21, 21. I'm just fooling with you right now, and I was then too. Um, great chapter. I'm glad we were able to read that. And, and where does our help come from? It comes from it. Back to Psalm 46. I like how the psalmist words this, a very present help in trouble. The word trouble means in tight places, distress, cramped quarters, a constricted feeling, and that's what it's like when you've got all these problems bombarding you, you feel that way. Uh, he has helped you uh, through trouble in the past. He's going to help you through trouble in the future, but I like it right here. The present, a very present help. He's going to help you right now. All right? You're having a problem, you're having a difficulty, challenge, bad news, present help. His help is here, presently, it's here right now. Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can men do to me? God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. Will the earth be moved, give way? Though the mountains be moved into the, into the sea, though the water roars and, and foams, so, though the, the mountains quake at its swelling, verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High God. The scene suddenly shifts from these terrible things that are happening in, in the world, or from nature, to the pleasant thought of a stream, a river with streams. God is our supply. He supplies this river for us. The psalmists, the sons of Korah, the ones who were writing this, we're thinking about a constant flowing river, not just a creek which carries a flash flood and then dries up. Um, no, uh, this was something that was constantly flowing, and, and it could be partial fulfillment could be seen in King Hezekiah's day. In 2 Chronicles 32, we learn of the water that King Hezekiah brought into the city of Jerusalem, the holy habitation of the Most High God. 
It wasn't buckets of water. Rather, he diverted a stream of water from uh, the Gion Spring to the Pool of Siloam, underground through a man-made tunnel, hewn out of solid rock, 1,777 feet long, in order to bring this water in. Thus, throughout the fearful siege of the city by Sennacherib and the Assyrian army, there was a river, the streams of who make glad the city of God. No question, we will see the fulfillment of this when we get to heaven. The Apostle John's vision of, of heaven includes this river in Revelation 22, 21. The angel showed me the river of water of light, broad as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the land through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the river of life with its twelve kinds of fruit yields its fruit. Each month, the leaves of the trees were for healing of the nation. Our needs will be supplied when we get to heaven. No question about that, whatever those needs are. But I'm seeing this also on earth as well as he supplies our needs. Might I be reading too much into it? I mean, the Apostle Paul wrote, And my God shall supply your needs, all your needs, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We know, according to God's word, that every day we wake up, there's a new set of mercies that are handed to us. They're going to last us all the way through the day. And we go to bed, we go to sleep, and the next day, there's a new set of mercies that are handed to us. Every day, our needs are supplied. Verse 6, God is sovereign. The nations rage. The kingdom totters. The word rage is the same word for waters roaring in verse 3. And totter is the same word of mountains being moved in verse 2. Just like God was able to control over nations, or nature rather, as noted in the earlier verses, he has control over these as well because he is sovereign. The word sovereign or sovereignty are, are big church words in reference to God. It means having the right the authority and the power to govern over all that happens and what has, is, or will happen, being in accordance to his divine will. He has the right to achieve his purposes and has the power to bring about the circumstances that dictate whatever he wills to come to pass. He has complete control of everything, and there is nothing that is done that is not done or allowed through his will. Psalm 115.3, our God is in heaven. He does all that he pleases. Romans 8.28 sums it up for us. And we know that for those who love God, all things work out according to, uh, together for good, according to those who are called according to his purpose. Interesting thought at the end of verse 6. He utters his voice, the earth melts. Now I needed some help with this, and so I, I did some uh, crowdsourcing uh, from my friends on Facebook to see what things melt. And uh, they came up with a, a long list of things. Uh, that melt. Um, and um, probably the funniest one was this gal wrote, she said the word fat. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe she'll tell me how that works. She said her mother, when she dies, wants to be cremated so that all the fat will melt, she said. <laughs> and then that reminded me of the one woman who said that uh, she's always been smoking hot, and when she's cremated, she'll be smoking hot again. So, uh, you know, I don't know, but uh, fat, does that melt? Well, he utters his voice and it melts. And, and the question is, um, how do we understand this uh, uttering of his voice? Um, it could be read in a more of a caring sense, um, even maybe romantic, we might say it. Uh, every time I hear his voice, my, my heart melts. This is something Bonnie would say to me. Every time I hear his voice. Um, and all, all the time she'll say that voice, just hearing that voice. I would be willing to sell this voice to you if you would like to have uh, what I would like to say speak nothing to you as well. And, uh, so it could be said in that sense, or it could be said in a loud voice, which would cause it to melt. I've always had a loud voice. My uh, one grandfather said I sounded like a foghorn when I was a baby and I cried. Um, I don't know if that's good or not. I know that from my report card, especially from Evie Loggenslater's school in sixth grade with Mr. Potson, where I sat, uh, Joel, um, just this week I was doing some studying on the sermon and I sat in the very spot. I took a picture of it, the very spot I used to sit in his class. I am, as you know, I was the oldest ongoing student that school building has ever known. I went to school there in 65. And then I started seminary in 77, and I graduated in 99. So I was in that building for four decades. And now I've got to tear it down, and I'm very upset about that. No, no, no. And anyway, Mr. Potson would write, uh, he's too loud. Even when I whispered, I was too loud. And I guess it was because...
because of uh, this voice. Well, Mount Sinai, the children of Israel, were about to hear the voice of God, and they did, and it sounded like thunder, and they didn't like it. And they went to Moses, and they said, oh, no, 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 no. You listen to God and tell us what he said. We don't want to listen to him. It's too loud. We might melt, they may have thought. So when he says he uttered his voice, could it be with a loud shout? One gal noted, and she's from one of our churches up in New York, who uh, is memorizing this chapter along with me as well, and, and she said, no, I think it could be a soft voice. God doesn't have to speak loud. He just has to say it, and we'll think it, and it could be done. Well, no question of sovereignty is seen in this. And then God is with us from verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. This refers to God as being commander-in-chief of the heavenly armies. The Lord is a mighty warrior, more than able to vanquish the enemy. He's in charge, and he defends his children. His promise is to never leave us or forsake us. The quote initially comes from Moses, who gave this to his people near the end of his life. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6. In the New Testament, we see it again. This time at the end of the first set of instructions that the writer of Hebrew gives in chapter 13, he says, keep your life free from the love of money, be content with what you have, for he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Remember, one of Jesus' names was Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means what? We'll get out of here a whole lot faster if you can play along here. God with us, that's what it means, God with us. And he is indeed with us. He's not only with us, but in these two verses, verse 7 and 11, we see that God is our fortress. He's our protection. Uh, the God of Jacob is our fortress. A fortress was the protection for Mid-Easterners when this psalm uh, would have been written. Those who lived in tents were sitting ducks for marauders and invaders. Those who lived in towns or cities which had no walls were defenseless, could easily be defeated. But those who were in the fortress were protected cities with walls, like a fortress. So to have God as our fortress gives off the idea of protection. The fact that he is God of Jacob brings to light all that he did for Jacob and his family, the Israelites, how he was their fortress. He reminded, however, that our fortress or protection is not in better circumstances or in avoiding problems or in anything on this earth. Instead, our protection is the very presence of the Holy Spirit and the solid rock work of Jesus on our behalf, which has guaranteed our help and promised that we will make it safely home to glory. Psalm 19, 2, the Lord, my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And then God is in control. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. He burns the char chariots of fire. Some of you are thinking, wait a second, this is the same as number five, God who is sovereign. It is indeed. But I needed ten. And this is a different verse. So we got control. It's, it is the same. He starts with the past and the present. Come, behold his works, the desolations he has brought. These things have already happened. Then he goes to the future when he ends war. He gets rid of the instruments of war, the bow, the spear, the chariot. Oh, how I wish that were now. Maranatha, but Lord Jesus. God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. And because of this, God will be exalted. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Again, this is future. Philippians 2, 10, 11, so that at the same name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. God wins. In the end, he wins. He brings peace. During Isaiah's time, Judah was looking for help from the Egyptians. And even though God warned against it, Judah did not need Egyptian might. They needed reliance on the Lord. Here's what Isaiah said, And repentance and rest is your salvation, and quietness and trust and strength. Not in the Egyptians. Put it into him. To be exalted, think of the winning coach who is hoisted to the shoulders of, of their players as they carry him off the field. Of course, nowadays they dump him with Gatorade or something like that. But I, and I like that song, I will exalt it. For thou, O Lord, art high above the earth, thou art exalted above all gods. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord, I exalt thee, I exalt thee. I like that. And then number five, God is God. All these characteristics are just a few of God's attributes, but they show that God is God, and there is no one like him. 
Isaiah 46, 9, God says, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Sounds pretty exclusive, doesn't it? Doesn't quite fit in in our tolerant society. But I don't care, and neither does God. God is God, there is none other. Now the more you know of God, and of God, there are some results, some pleasing results. Let's go back and look at these. Therefore, I will not fear. Though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the water roars and foams, though the mountains quake at a swelling, uh, these are major catastrophes. These are earthquakes and mountains being moved. In 1883, a devastating eruption took place on an island in Indonesia. The mountain of Krakatoa exploded, killing more than 30,000 people, mostly from the huge tsunamis triggered by the eruption. The eruption was one of the first global news events after telegraph lines had connected the different continents. From the explosion, five cubic miles of matter exploded and a mountain vanished. It happens. Every year there are avalanches out west, snow barreling down the mountainside, swallowing up anything in its path. Right? It sounds like thunder, they say. Thunder rolling through the mountains. If you've ever lived through a major earthquake, you know what I'm talking about. But if we know God, and know that he's still on the throne, and he's not sleeping, you know, he never does sleep. He's always awake. If we know him and know about him, we can be fearless through these things. Well, we might die in that natural disaster, but, but we're going to be with Jesus. So it's a win-win. Whenever I fly, my, our daughter will often encourage us and uh, text us before we go, wishing us safety for the trip. And I will say to her, as I do every time, if the plane goes down, I'm going up. Um, and she'll say, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, no matter what we The Apostle Paul declared in Romans 8, 38, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is indeed a beautiful world in which we live, but terrible things will happen to us. Yet I will not fear because God is with us. Therefore, secondly, I will be still. That takes us back to the verse, the sermon that I preach, being still. I know both the English expression and the translated thought. The English expression, be still, be quiet. Shh. This is one of the first non-words or expressions that we learn. Shh. Close your mouth. Be still. Translated thought of the phrase, be still, could be translated with such words as stop, desist, drop your weapons. Make peace. It means to cease, to become inactive, to cease stirring. Now is the time to stop. Go to God in prayer. Ask for help. Listen to him. Michael W. Smith, in his rendition of a song entitled Be Still, after repeating the phrase, Be still and know that I am God three times, then he sings, Be Speechless. Oh, I like that. Because we like to speak all the time. We need to be speechless and sometimes. He ends the song, Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is our Father. Come rest your head upon his breast. Listen to the rhythm of his unfailing heart of love, beating for his little ones, calling each of us to come. Be still. Be still. Thirdly, we will live in his fortress. Biblical writer John P. Phillips tells the story of the bombing of the British Island, uh, Islands, Isles, sorry, during World War II. He was just a kid at the time, but he remembered at first when the air raid sirens went off three times a night, and the aircraft um, sounded like thunder, and, and the bombs would, would be screaming down. Uh, for their air raid, the, the dad ushered the four children into the kitchen and, and, and put them under the kitchen table. Well, that wasn't going to be very much protection. Well, after one or two close calls, Philip notes, his dad dug a hole in the backyard. He lined it with, with corrugated iron, and he covered it with a thick iron roof. Then he piled all the dirt from the hole on top of the roof for added protection. He put some bunk beds, some emergency rations, buckets of water, a, a stirrup pump, and they had a bomb shelter. And J.B. Phillips noted, it was our refuge, it was our strength, it was our fortress. Somehow, picture in your mind that God is a fortress, that he is a castle, that he is a rock that you run to when you go to him and you live within that fortress. No one can break it down. This fortress remains forever. When times of trouble come into our life, how do you respond? When you get hit by a terrifying diagnosis, when the constant emotional or physical pain won't cease, 
When the dark clouds of depression continue to hover, when you lose your job, do not be afraid. Trust God and seek His help. When current events are terrifying, don't you be. God is still in control. Recall how God has helped you in the past. Trust Him for the present and the future. I want to recommend to you that uh, this verse, this chapter rather, becomes one of your chapters. Maybe one that you would memorize. Um, because it tells us about God. And, and it tells us when we're going through those difficult times that He is going to be with us. This church has gone through difficult times, losing loved ones, suddenly, some. He's still. He's still. God's in control. Nothing has caught Him off guard. He knows what He's doing. Just trust Him.
this particular chapter, Psalm 46, was the favorite uh, chapter of Martin Luther. And whenever Martin Luther and Melanchthon, his, uh, his, his associate, whenever they were going through the deepest waters, Martin Luther would say to him, let's sing Psalm 46. Let's sing Psalm 46. Well, then he put it to work. A mighty fortress is our God. So with exultation in our hearts, let us sing this great, great hymn of the faith, which reflects Psalm 46.